Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Yasmina Greco. I'm with O'Reilly Media, and I will be your host for today's webcast. We'd like to begin today's webcast by saying a very big thank you to Teradata for sponsoring today's event and let you all know Open Source R is the fastest growing analytics software. In terms of user base and algorithms, with more than 5,500 packages supported by a vibrant user base. Surveys tell us that 60 to 70 percent of data miners use R, the tool of choice for data scientists. One of the major challenges of R today is data and processing scalability. Teradata Aster R solves the scalability issue by running open source R directly in the Teradata Aster database leveraging the Aster MPP architecture. Teradata Aster R is designed for the R user supporting existing R tools, language, and packages, and provides pre-built R functions that run in parallel across all data, hiding the complexity of parallel processing. Another powerful capability is the Aster R parallel constructor that allows users to build their own parallel analytics for more than 5,500 R analytic packages or any new analytic functions developed in the open source community. In our webcast today, we will talk about how these advancements help break through current R limitations. Thank you again, Teradata. Folks joining us from Teradata today are James Taylor and Bill Franks. James is the CEO and a principal consultant of Decision Management Solutions. He is the leading expert in how to use business rules and analytic technology to build decision management systems. James is passionate about using decision management systems to help companies improve decision making and development on agile, analytic, and adaptive business. He provides strategic consulting to companies of all sizes working with clients in all sectors to adopt decision-making technology. James has spent the last 20 years developing approaches, tools, and platforms that others can use to build more effective information systems. He has led decision management efforts for leading companies in insurance, banking, health management, and telecommunications. Bill Franks is Chief Analytics Officer for Teradata providing insight on trends in the analytics and big data space, and helping clients understand how Teradata and its analytic partners can support their efforts. In this role, Bill also works to help determine the right strategies and positioning for Teradata in the areas of analytics and big data. Bill's focus has always been to help translate complex analytics into terms that business users can understand and then help an organization implement the results effectively within their processes. His work has spanned clients in a variety of industries for companies ranging in size from Fortune 100 to small nonprofit organizations. Folks, we're very excited to have James and Bill with us today to present this webcast for you all. As we get the event started, I'd like to go over a little housekeeping to help you get the most out of today's webcast. First, you'll want to open your group chat widget if you haven't already done so. This is where we can interact with each other during the event and where you can submit your questions for James and Bill. We find that our audience usually has a lot of good knowledge to share, so we encourage you all to chat freely during the event. However, if you have questions for James and Bill, please preface them with a capital letter Q so we know that it's for them and we can make sure we see it for Q&A. You can also open, move, and resize any of the other widgets. If you'd like to tweet from the Twitter widget today, you might need to give it permission to access your account. The Twitter widget will automatically append the event's hashtag to your tweet so you don't have to. And today, folks, our hashtag is StratacONF, all one word. If you have any trouble with the webcast, please take a look at your help widget if you continue to have trouble, just post it in the group chat and one of our staff will help you right away. If you have choppy audio or stalled visuals, please try refreshing your window. And remember, the best thing you can do for a good audio stream is close any apps that could interfere. People always ask, so we'd like you to know, 
We are recording today's webcast, and we will have the archive ready, usually within 48 hours. And folks, as we begin the program today, we would like to bring your attention to the screen where you have a polling question, polling question number one on the screen for you. If you can please take a moment and respond to that, that will help our presenters better direct their presentation for you all today. What best describes your company's use of R today? Know our plans in the near future? Exploring or experimenting with R? Plans to use R for analytics? Actively using R for model development only? Or actively using R for model development and deployment? And folks, at this time, I'm going to turn the program over to James. Hello, James. Hi there. All right. So let's uh, – we're uh, – going to give the polls a minute here to, uh, to, to come through, and then I'm going to start talking. So let's, uh, can we see the poll result? All right. All right, so that, I'm a little surprised by that. 15% with no plans at all for R. That's, a, that's often not, that's a, that's a slightly higher percentage than I might have expected. That most people will say they have some plan for R. But the, but the big one here, exploring or experimenting with R, that's very much what I see. I see a lot of folks out there Obviously, a lot of folks using R, actively using R, well on the path to R, but I see a, a tremendous amount of interest in R. Right? And that's reflected here by uh, you know, over half of you with plans or uh, an exploration sort of mindset around R. So let's just sort of uh, level set. Let's just make sure we're all clear what we mean by R, what we're talking about when we talk about R. So we're, um, we're talking about the R project for statistical computing. And you know, R is, is an interpreted language for all sorts of statistical operations that you can do on, on data. It's widely used, particularly in data mining and more advanced kinds of analytics, and, and a lot in visualization. It's free. It's open source. Uh, it's tremendously extensible. So as was said at the beginning, you've got thousands of packages, certainly at least 5,000 packages on the main site, perhaps as many as 7,500 packages once you start including uh, other places where you can go and get the packages, all uh, by and large freely available. It's been around since the late 90s um, and uh, in development and used since then. And we're now at like version 3. But what's really noticeable is the tremendous growth over recent years. Uh, I've got two graphs here that, I, that I've used, uh, data sources that I'm going to refer to as we go through. At uh, the bottom right, you can see the tremendous growth in packages. Uh, this is the number of packages available on uh, the main site. This is a stat I, I pulled from R4 Stats, uh, Bob Munchkin's site, where he tracks a lot of interesting data about R and about statistical languages more generally. And you can see this steady but accelerating curve uh, in terms of the number of packages available for R. So the breadth of R, the things you can do with R, ha have really expanded over the last few years. And you see that reflected also in usage. Uh, the other survey that I'm going to refer to a lot is the REXA Analytics Survey. Carl REXA does this great survey of data miners and, and analytics professionals asking about what tools they use, what they think of their tools, what their challenges are, how much data they're using, all sorts of interesting questions, and tracks them year after year. And one of the most interesting results the last couple of years, and you can see that in the graph here, is this growth in R uh, from you know, back in 2007, with 20-some you know, percent of people reporting that they use R somewhat, to now 70% of people say they use R somewhat. And, and back in 2008, only a very small percentage of people saying that R was their primary mechanism for doing advanced analytics, to uh, you know, nearly a quarter of all data miners saying that, that R has become uh, their primary mechanism for building analytic models. So R, you know, been around for, you know, for a long time, 27 years, whatever it is now, uh, it's grown tremendously in recent years until it has become uh, a very fixed point in the analytic landscape. And it's something you have to consider when you start thinking about analytic strategies, you start thinking about what you're going to do with more advanced analytics. Now, uh, enough about let's, let's talk about uh, what happens as we make this transition from thinking about uh, one analytic model or our first analytic model, or what our plans might be to how are we as an enterprise going to become what, what Tom Davenport likes to call an analytic competitor? How do we make analytics, particularly advanced analytics, data mining, predictive analytics, a core piece of our enterprise approach? How do we move to uh, enterprise analytics? What are some of the requirements we have? What are some of the things we must do if we're going to succeed with analytics at scale? 
And I was trying to think of a framework for I had sort of four points I wanted to make, and I tried to think of a framework for it. And I thought I would use another thing from the late 90s, uh, Chris DM. Now, if you are not familiar with Chris DM, I highly recommend that you become familiar with it. It's a great methodology for um, how to build, uh, how to conduct data mining projects. It's the uh, cross-industry standard process for data mining, Chris DM, built by a consortium back in the late 90s. It uh, hasn't really been revised but still uh, by far the most popular framework for doing analytic projects. And you see it's got this nice iterative feel to it, very uh, you know, continuous improvement focus, which is really important. But when you look at this picture, you can see four key enterprise challenges fit into this framework. So when I talk to companies that are moving from their first analytic model to broad-based use of analytics, and I see them trying to build and client analytics groups trying to adopt analytics uh, across the enterprise, I see them struggling in four areas. The first of these is in this business understanding area. How do I clearly express my analytic objectives? How do I make sure I'm building an analytic I'm going to be able to use? How do I tie that analytic into the way my business processes and my systems work? How do I make sure that what I build is going to be useful and have a positive impact on my enterprise? So that's the first challenge. The second challenge comes in this sort of data understanding, uh, particularly in the area of big data. How do I make sure that I'm going to be able to look at all my data, pull in all these different data sources, analyze it effectively, and, and uh, make sure I, I can see in my data what might be possible? Then I go through this sort of next three steps, which are really a sort of a set here, data preparation, modeling, and evaluation. How do I uh, prepare my data, clean it up, uh, create calculated attributes and characteristics, feed that into a modeling algorithms, perhaps build ensembles of models, and then feed all of that into an evaluation process to see how predictive it is. Well, that's a, the sort of core of a data mining project. And how do I make sure that that's scalable, that I can do this uh, rapidly, effectively, I can have lots of people participate in it, I can manage that process, and that I can do all of it in a sort of timely, iterative fashion. And then lastly, and again, perhaps the other piece of the analytic puzzle that gets neglected, deployment. It does me no good to have an analytic, but I don't use it. So how do I make sure I can get it deployed? How do I solve those problems? And when you get to an enterprise scale, the big question here is, well, how do I make sure that I have very seamless, quick, cheap, scalable deployment of my analytics? So what I want to do in this section of the presentation is go through these four challenges and try and talk about them a little uh, and set some context here. As you try and move analytics to an enterprise scale, what challenges must you deal with? The first one is this clear sense of the analytic objective. And uh, this is an area I spend personally a lot of time. I do a lot of work with organizations trying to figure out how to specify business understanding. And what we increasingly find uh, we are using in our projects is this sense of decision modeling. We're trying to model the business decision that you're trying to influence with analytics so that you can tie the specific business action you're trying to take, in this case a marketing offer you're trying to make, the decision you're trying to make to a specific analytic that you're trying to build. So you can say, the reason I'm going to build this analytic is because it's going to improve this decision in this way, and here's how I'm going to tell that I've succeeded. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this, partly because I could talk about it for a long time, um, and it's a sort of a relatively detailed topic, but mostly because this really cuts across every single analytic platform. It's the same problem no matter what analytic platform you have picked. It doesn't matter whether you pick R or something else, you are always going to have to deal with this problem. So obviously that makes it a very big problem, but it also makes it less interesting in the context of a webinar about R. So let's move to the second problem. Second problem is how do I explore my data when my data is big, is big data? Well, let's think about what it means to be big data in this context. And I realize it's a buzzword that gets overused, but still it has some value. So first of all, volume. We have more and more data. Uh, and in particular, we have more sources of data uh, driving us to have to analyze more data. So how do we make sure that when we're exploring this data, we can do that at a, you know, despite these huge volumes? How do we make sure we can uh, understand all the data that we have available to us? We talk about the velocity of big data. This data is arriving more quickly. It changes more rapidly. We've got more streaming data, more real-time data, more intraday data. So anything I do to understand this data, I have to go to do quickly enough that I can uh, iterate quickly through data that's changing on a continuous basis. So I've got to be able to handle lots of data, and I've got to be able to handle it fast so I can scale uh, and iterate. And yet, 
this is made more complicated because in an era of big data, I have to be realistic. I've got more and more kinds of data, a variety of data types that's available to me, unstructured data, semi-structured data, sensor data, weblog data. How do I bring all those data types to bear? How do I make sure I understand my data? And then lastly, uh, the other, you know, people will increase the number of Vs as far as I can tell arbitrarily, but there is one more that's relevant here, which is veracity. Um, as I add new data types, as I bring in external data, third-party data, um, how do I bring this data in a way and, and make sure I can analyze it so I can verify that it's got some meaning, that it makes some sense in the context of my overall uh, business? So I have to be able to explore big data. That's my first, sort of my second, I guess my second enterprise challenge. Now the third one is how do I ha make sure that this general preparation, modeling, evaluation process, this sort of core data mining process, is truly enterprise scale? How do I make sure that I can integrate all the different data that I need. I've got lots of different data sources, lots of different kinds of data, and uh, our surveys suggest that more experienced data miners tend to bring in more data types, so it gets worse rather than better. And I've got to be able to bring all this data in no matter where it's stored, no matter how it's stored, and get access to it. So I have this sort of data integration scale question. And having brought all this data in, I really want to be able to work with all of it. Sure, there are some valid reasons for sampling data, for instance, that can be very helpful. But I don't want to be forced into a sampling scenario. I don't want to have to restrict myself from looking at all the data if what I really need or really want to be able to do is look at all the data. So how do I scale so I can handle this huge amount of data that I might have? And you see a lot of focus, for instance, on in-database and in-data store activities because it helps scale that um, uh, analysis. Obviously, I need to be able to apply a variety of tools. Now, if you look at the REXA survey, uh, you'll see that the same three or four techniques appear at the top of the list of algorithms all the time. But most people, the average data miner, tends to use you know, approaching around double figures in terms of total algorithms. So uh, that's something that you have to sort of be realistic. You've got to be able to have lots of tools that you can apply to your data. Now, as I said, iteration is really important. Uh, these things are very rarely black and white. Analytic projects tend to be uh, complex, so I've got to be able to iterate, try new things, experiment, run a different set of algorithms, build a different ensemble, and do that rapidly so that I can converge quickly on a scenario that works or discover that I can't converge on one that works, move forward, and get things up and running. So I've got to be able to iterate rapidly. Now, this is not an academic exercise. It's not just about finding the best result. It's about making sure that I get a result I can use that's going to add business value. And finally, uh, I've got to be realistic. In a, in a modern world, ensembles matter. If you're not already thinking about ensemble modeling, that is to say, using sort of uh, several techniques together, uh, building models at, that are sort of composites of several techniques, then you will be soon. Ensembles matter, and they exaggerate all of these problems. It makes it uh, more complicated to do all these different things. Now, this is great. Now I can apply these things and say, I've got this kind of environment. I build a great model, a great set of models. Well, I've got to make sure that I can deploy it. I've got to be able to make sure that I don't just know something, that I can do something. Knowing something is not enough. I have to be able to act on what I know. Take that Netflix prize we're all familiar with. You know, a million dollars for an algorithm that was more predictive, they don't use it. And they don't use it because it was too hard to deploy. Too hard to deploy, too hard to code, uh, not scalable enough for the scale of problem they have. So you can't just focus on the analytic. You have to focus on the deployment of that analytic. What that means is we have to move away from an environment which we find ourselves in typically where we've got an operational system and we suck data out of it and we put it into an analytic system and then we go analyze it. Well, that's great. But how do we make sure that what we did actually goes back and influences those operational systems? How do we make sure that those processes, the systems that gather all that data, that represent the running business of our organization, how do we make sure we influence them? How do we make sure that we're actually making decisions based on those analytics so that we can actually influence our day-to-day -day operations? If we're going to do that at an enterprise level, we need a sort of seamless, scalable deployment capability. We need to be able to take what we build as models and rapidly deploy them. We can't spend a lot of time recoding them. We can't spend a lot of time and effort sort of rebuilding our models. We've got to get them out there and deploy it. Secondly, we've got to be able to do this in a batch mode and in a real-time mode. There's a lot of focusing analytics on batch deployment, scoring everybody, extracting everybody above a certain score. That kind of batch mindset doesn't match very well with the sort of real-time 
mobile, always-on kind of response that you need today. And then finally, uh, we've got to be able to scale this deployment just from a sheer practicality point of view. And we've got more and more customers. We've got more and more scores. We want to do it faster and faster. You know, any deployment vehicle we have has to work fast. We have to be able to scale it. We have to be able to get that um, model out there into a real enterprise deployment. So four critical enterprise challenges. Now, those were, if you like, generic enterprise analytic challenges. They would be true. They would be the same list of challenges, no matter what tool you told me you were using or, or you know, uh, what mix of tools you were going to use. So how do we sort of mesh that now? Let's talk about open source R. What, if anything, is unique about using open source R to try and solve these problems? Are there things that we have to be particularly aware of as we use open source R as our primary uh, or perhaps of one of our major analytic platforms. And as you saw from the Rexa data, more and more people are doing this. So what are the challenges? Well, you know, let's go through that list of enterprise challenges. So that first one, um, clear sense of the analytic objective. Really nothing specific to R, just a general purpose enterprise analytics problem. Data exploration. I need a powerful data exploration uh, environment. And when I think about that in terms of open source, I, I identify two key challenges. I've got to be able to deal with this very complex data integration problem, and that has challenges for open source. And I've got to be able to scale my ability to really understand this data, um, uh, you know, go through this data understanding exercise in a Christian sense uh, at scale. Both of those are our challenge, have challenges from an R perspective. I've got to be able to create this scalable, uh, preparation model, evaluate, prepare, model, evaluate cycle, and I've got to be able to do that at scale. Well, the time it takes me to do some of that analysis is an issue. I've got to make sure I can do that fast enough to iterate, and that creates challenges. And then when we get to seamless and scalable deployment, this general sense of how do I deploy R is a bit of a challenge. And then how do I industrialize this whole process? How do I make sure that I'm thinking in terms of an industrial mindset. And I'll come back to that as my sort of wrap-up point at the end. So these are the five challenges that I believe that if you're trying to use R as a primary component of an enterprise-scale analytic effort, you have to deal with. So let's deal with those one at a time. Complex data integration. Let's think about where we live today. Uh, when you look at surveys like, like the Rexa survey, it becomes clear that New data sources, so the availability of new kinds of data is what's driving increases in volume. It also drives increases in variety, of course, too. But the, the sheer number of sources is starting to be an issue. Now, of course, those sources might be stored in a relational database or your data warehouse, but they might be in a NoSQL format. They might be something that makes more sense to store in Hadoop or a columnar layout. Lots of different data types, lots of different data formats, lots of different data feeds. And our evidence from our surveys as decision management solutions is that more successful analytic teams tend to use an increasing variety of data. So the more successful you are, the more impact your analytics start to have, the more likely you are to need to bring in still more data types. And you have to be able to somehow weave this whole set of data together into a coherent set of data to present into your analytic algorithms. And in R, this can be a little bit of a challenge. The good news about R is it's tremendously flexible. I can code all these things. I can bring in all these different data types. And the bad news is that I have to code all these things. I have to actually write data frames. I have to pull this data in. I have to decide how much of each data source to make available. I have to decide how I'm going to join them and how I'm going to integrate them. And I have to write code and scripts to do all of that. And so the, the sense of data integration complexity uh, can create a sort of uh, a burden when you're trying to scale R at an enterprise level. Now, let's assume I can get all my data integrated, and I, I'm now looking at how do I understand this data. Well, now I have to deal with this reality of increased data, right? We see more and more data, bigger data sets. Um, we see even bigger data sets coming down the pike towards us. And what you see again in surveys is that the biggest impact of this volume is how long it takes to understand what the data is telling me, the time and effort to analyze this increased amount of data. Now, when you look at this scenario, this part of the puzzle, the challenge you have is that it comes down to the sort of nature of R. You know, it's mostly, many of the algorithms, many of those packages are single-threaded. 
Um, so parallel execution, although it's supported by some packages, it's not consistently supported across the, the platform, and it can be tricky to get some of these algorithms to work in a multi-thread environment. And one of the reasons people like R is they can tinker with R. They can change algorithms. But once you start tinkering with algorithms, then making them run in parallel is even more complicated because it's uh, statistically complex sometimes to decide how it is you split up analysis across multiple uh, nodes and how you put it back together again. It, R is typically constrained to be in memory. And, and while memory is cheaper and everything else, uh, you still have challenges in terms of making sure you can get all that data in. So you end up uh, forcing sampling, forcing people to use less than all of the data that's available to them. Uh, and that tends to, you know, it's not always a bad thing, but it can be. It can be very limiting to have to look at a sample. And then regardless of whether you sample or not, the time it takes to do this, if it takes you too long, well, what happens is you iterate less often. You try fewer different approaches. You look at fewer different angles, if you like, in your data. And any data miner will tell you that that ability to iterate quickly to get lots of different perspectives is really important to how good your value is. Now, when you look at some of the survey data that's out there and you start asking some of these questions, you know, what you find is that our users are um, you know, happy about a lot of things about our. Uh, but they're not terribly happy about its ability to handle large data sets. This is uh, a place where our users score their tools poorly relative to some of the commercial competitors. They, they don't like the way R handles very large data points. So scaling data understanding is a bit of a challenge. Now, relate, closely related to that, obviously, is how long does it take you to do some of these things? Now, our users, like I say, they really like their tools. They like how many algorithms are available. They like how much they can tinker with them, how much they can fine tune them. But when you start looking at some of the details, there are some things they don't like. It tends to take longer to do data analysis. If you look at the graph on the bottom right here, the green bars, the ones marked with R, uh, show that fewer people uh, get their analysis done in days or less, and more people take weeks or longer. So the time it takes to do analysis skews. In general, R users seem to spend longer doing analysis. It takes them longer to complete that analysis. Uh, and obviously, that tends to reduce the number of iterations you can do and uh, makes it uh, you know, just a slower process overall. But you also notice a couple of other things. When you ask our users, they start to complain more often, uh, particularly amongst more frequent users, about their tool limits, the limitations that their tools put on them when it comes to things like scale and analysis. And scaling up is a relatively uh, commonly reported challenge. If you ask people what challenges they have, scaling up doesn't score very high by and large, but it does score pretty highly amongst our users. So there's this sense that scaling up, taking, getting analysis to happen faster, these things are a challenge for our users. Similarly, uh, deployment is a challenge. So uh, we know from the Rexa survey and from other surveys that at least a third of all analytic projects have serious deployment challenges. It takes too long, costs too much, um, and uh, that's across the board. The, the, there's a high risk uh, with any analytic project that it won't be used or won't be used quickly or it'll take too long, cost too much to deploy. But our users uh, are less likely to re report rapid deployment, more likely to, to report uh, very slow deployment. They're much more likely to report that they use, their analysis is not being used at all. Um, and in general, they, they are not happy with the ease of deployment uh, or the performance of the systems that they build. So they have a general sense that deploying this stuff is a little bit too hard, it's a little bit too time consuming, takes a little bit too long, costs a little bit too much money. Now, I wanted to leave you with a, with a final thought. There is a slight tendency in analytics land uh, to think of analytics as a very artisanal industry, me and my tools handcrafting the perfect model uh, in my workshop. And while this is a, you know, might be a fun activity, um, from a commercial perspective, it's not quite the right attitude. We need to be thinking much more in terms of how do I turn out lots of models good enough to drive my business forward in an analytic way. And so that means we've got to think differently about the kinds of tools we use. We've got to stop thinking in terms of you know, my local scripts that I'm managing on my PC, that I'm handcrafting uh, to be just so, um, and I'm done when I create the first one. When I get the model created, I'm done, 
And it's really just me working on it anyway. I'm, a, I'm an individual craftsperson working on my model. And I've got to move to a much more industrial mindset. I look, talk a lot about industrializing analytics when it comes to enterprise scale. I've got to manage the workflow of my different projects. I've got to automate pieces of this so that I can handle the kind of scale I'm talking about. I've got to be able to manage all these models and have lots of people participate in this process so that I can turn out the number of models that I need. I've got to think in terms of industrialization. And open source R uh, grew up in this very artisanal environment. And so uh, you have to think about, if you're going to adopt R as a core part of your analytic strategy, how do I industrialize it? What do I need to add to open source R to make sure that I can deliver on this industrial scale? So a pretty rapid run through. My key things that I think uh, I observe when I think about uh, how you scale to enterprise analytics using open source R. How do you handle complex data integration? How do you make sure you can pull together and access all these different data types, all these different data storage mechanisms? How do you make sure that you can understand all the data that's flowing into your organization and understand it quickly enough and at scale so that you can iterate rapidly through it? How do you make sure you can analyze all this data and build models quickly? Again, so you can iterate, but also so you can make sure your models are timely, that they reflect what's going on right now. And how do you deploy those models? out into production to make sure that you could act on them and drive analytic results. And overall, how do you industrialize R? How do you take the undoubted benefits of R, the huge number of packages, the broad adoption, the, the fact that lots of people know R, and how do you scale that out so that you can truly industrialize analytics and drive your organization to become an enterprise scale user of advanced analytics? And with that, I'm going to hand you back to the the host and on the poll. Thanks very much, James. Folks, we are going to push out to you poll number two. Take a moment, please. Look at the screen. If you could respond, that will help the presenters today to focus the presentation on your needs. And poll number two is asking, what are your biggest challenges with R? And if you could select all that apply. Complex data integration, scaling data understanding, time to analyze, deployment, industrializations, or other. Please, if you could take a moment to respond to that, we'd appreciate that very much. And also a good time, folks, to let you all know, if you do have a question for James and Bill and what they're talking to you about today, please open that group chat widget you have in your widget box. Click on it, open it, type it in, send it in, and we will take as many as we have time for during Q&A. And folks, I'm going to push out your poll results so you can see. Where's your poll results? There it is, right there on the screen. And we are going to transition the program now over to Bill. Hello, Bill. Hello, thank you. Uh, so I think that uh, this distribution is pretty much uh, along the lines of what I anticipated in that the problems at the bottom, the deployment and industrialization, it's, uh, you can't really get to those issues until you've solved the prior issues. So uh, that distribution sort of falls right in line with the, uh, the flow of, a, of an effort. Uh, and so I, I, I anticipate that's probably a large part of what makes, uh, makes folks uh, answer that way. But what I'm going to do now is, is talk about how do you lift some of those limitations that uh, James just talked about that deal with open source R. And uh, I'm going to describe to you how the Aster R offering can really help you up your R game. Now before I do that, I just want to take a moment to explain the concept behind our discovery platform, Aster. So, you know, even five years ago, for the most part, organizations had their data in, in one type of warehouse or another, largely with an SQL interface. As we know now, we're not only getting a lot more data, it's in uh, different formats, but it's actually even worse. What we end up finding is that even when you have data on one or more uh, systems to actually house it, there's a proliferation of analytic tools and servers related to those tools to actually do your analysis. So you can see in the middle there R. You might have people running R both in a, uh, on uh, multiple data platforms. They'll, you'll tend to have people buying a separate text analytics server with its own software, maybe some graph analysis, some statistical software, and so forth. And you end up with a lot of data movement, a lot of uh, inefficiency in that process. So the goal of our Aster platform in general is to do two things. One, as I'll walk through, is to have a single entry point into multiple sources of data, not just what's stored directly on the Astro platform, but what's out in, in tools like Hadoop or Teradata. 
And equally important then is to enable all of the different types of analytics to be driven within the same exact platform, within the same interface. That's how the uh, ASTRAR integration fits in as we'll go through. So what I'm going to go through is these same five uh, specific issues that we just had on the survey and that uh, James walked through. I'm going to first start out by uh, getting into what is behind the Aster R offering. And then what I'm going to do after that is take you through a day in the life of an R user in terms of what does even some of the code look like? How would it be easy to help solve these problems today? So the first thing is that the goal of Teradata Aster R is to remove a lot of those scalability constraints. It's going to enable you to use any R uh, packages that you want to use, executed at scale, using your familiar client, your familiar language that you're used to using. But even better than that, it's enabling it within the Discover plat discovery platform that has not only hundreds of functions that enhance the core R uh, packages, but also enables easy access to multiple platforms worth of data. Because at the end of the day, what I don't want to do as an analyst is spend most of my time, as I did early in my career, simply going to different data sources, pooling data into my own environment, having to mash it all up, and then I can start analysis. If we can help streamline that entire process, that's going to make uh, uh, your life better, whether using R or any other tool. So there's three primary components that I'm going to walk through as we go, as we go through the next few minutes. First is the Aster R Parallel Library. It's a currently 100 plus functions, and we're going to continue to grow it, where we have built within Aster directly some uh, fully parallelized functions that you can call from R with uh, your familiar R syntax. We also have what we call the Parallel Constructor. This gets to be very interesting. It allows you to submit any arbitrary R code of your choice to run in a node-independent fashion in parallel on the Aster platform. I'm going to talk a little bit more about exactly what a node-independent uh, uh, parallelism versus system parallelism is. But this is where you can basically parallelize any code that you would like. It all fits within our SNAP framework which is that framework that allows us to not only bolt on different data sources, but different analysis uh, methodologies and types. So before we get into these, I need to explain one thing, and it's a little bit of a technical uh, topic, but it's unavoidable, which is to explain the implementation options that are typically used with R. And in fact, these same, uh, these same architectures uh, are often utilized with other analytic tools as well. The worst case scenario, uh, particularly with R, since it runs in memory by default, is the classic person who has downloaded R onto a desktop or maybe if they're lucky a server, wherever the data is, they pull it local and they're limited then in what they can run by the size of the memory pool on that box. Uh, that ends up requiring a, a lot of sampling, a lot of movement. One layer up from that is where uh, folks have a, a, a parallel analytics environment. Maybe they set up some uh, Hadoop cluster. They still pull the data off of wherever it started uh, then they bring it to those local machines. They can now at least run in memory on a variety of machines to get some parallelism, but you still end up with double the hardware. Uh, you're still constrained by the individual memory pools. So an improvement, but not, uh, not a great solution. Everything in Aster R is at least node level parallel. That's where the data is already sitting there. And in Aster, it's a, it's, it's a, a virtual thing. It could be the Parallel database, both whether it's relational or columnar within Aster. It could be the parallel file system, similar to uh, HDFS on Hadoop that Aster has. You can also have pointers to another database like Teradata or another data platform like uh, Hadoop. And the point is, it'll run on each of those uh, in a node-independent fashion, and we re remove that memory constraint. You no longer are constrained by memory. However big that file is, we stream it through and help you handle it. And the holy grail is system level parallelism. This is where instead of submitting one job to every node or every worker and getting one answer back per node or worker, system level parallelism is where the system will handle all of the communication that's required so that you submit one request and get one answer. That's the ultimate. Uh, and as I'll walk you through, a good portion of our Aster R uh, product family actually hits that use case. So Let's just do a really easy example of node versus system. Let's just say you wanted to do an overall average and, and you had, for example, sales. Here's a very easy example. There's four nodes that have a very small amount of data. If you submit in a node level fashion, give me the mean, 
what will actually happen is each of those nodes will independently compute their mean, and you'll get four means back. If you remember from STAT 101, however, you can't take a mean of means and get the right answer. So what you actually have to do then is program slightly differently. You have to request a sum and a count from every node. When you bring those sums and counts back, you can then total those and divide to get your overall average. So the point here is that node-level parallelism is very powerful, but the problem is that there's a lot of instances where you have to do some uh, different uh, coding, and you have to be aware of how to code for that parallel uh, environment. The system parallel function, of course, uh, when you ask for the mean, it would handle all of that uh, for you. So let's start with the after our pre-built function. This is a really neat functionality wherein what we've done is build out fully system parallel options where you can point to any file of any size or any table of any size with your familiar R syntax, ask it to run uh, some analytics, and it'll bring you back an answer. The key is, uh, of course, we don't have uh, every function parallelized, but we do have well over 100. And it starts with some of the tactical expected ones like, you know, creating a data frame or connecting to a database. But the more interesting ones start to be on the bottom, the statistical analysis options, the text and, and machine learning algorithms that we have parallelized. Because part of the, the key to understand is that if you're doing, say, everything by customer ID, as is often common in data preparation, maybe by customer ID or by uh, sensor ID, as long as the, each node has all of the data for each, uh, a given customer or a given sensor, then the difference between node and system parallel that doesn't matter because all the data for those five groups is on one node. But oftentimes when you're running models like a regression, of course, you want to run it on all of the data. That's where there's a big difference. So what we focused on is parallelizing the functions that are most often required in a system parallel context as opposed to some of the ones that are most often asked for where node parallel would be just fine. But it's pretty robust. Now, Let's assume that we don't have one that's unique. You can submit any arbitrary R code of your choice with any open source R package that's available directly to uh, Aster. It will stream it through, again, no memory constraints, and it'll run it in uh, node parallel. And so what we've set up as well is a, is a split apply combined strategy, very similar if you've ever worked with Hadoop with a MapReduce strategy, where you have uh, one script that'll run uh, out there at the node level, you bring back the results, and you run a second script on that uh, result. And I'll go back real quick to illustrate this with our average example. Here's some actual code. You point to some uh, banking data. You first uh, define your first function that's going to get the sum and the counts, as we talked about. Then you have your combined function there that's going to uh, get the sum of those sums and the sum of those counts and divide it. And then there's a very simple syntax that, again, follows uh, uh, very uh, standard-looking R code where you're able to call each of those to be uh, submitted one after the other on those results. So what this means is, in the case where you need to write your own fully parallel code, we completely enable that. Now, another key part to understand, then, is that this is all within that SNAP framework. And Teradata Query Grid, which you see there uh, right next to the SNAP framework, is really important because what it lets you do is map into Teradata, Hadoop, various other databases so that you can actually uh, uh, map it once and create a virtual view and then simply create a data frame and start to, to analyze that data. The query grid will take care of accessing that data and pulling it over for you. Similarly, across the top above the red box, you see various analytic uh, disciplines or genres or, or types. What you're able to do is now in a single script, you might be able to run some SQL, call some R code, call a graph analysis uh, uh, against any of these and intermix. It really helps solve some of that those issues of getting to some answers very quickly. So how are you going to use this? Let's talk about how to up your R game through some tangible examples of what someone using it would do on a day-to-day -day basis, and then we'll open it up for some Q&A. So for the first problem, the complex data integration. Again, the classic model would have been not only are you working in memory, which necessitates tons of samples, but you would have been logging on to each and every data source. There's two here. We have a data warehouse and Hadoop. You might have five that you have to keep logging on to every project, creating a sample, pulling it somewhere local to do all your analysis. With the query grid, as we talked about, here's a, a code example here where the, the top it says create view, Hadoop view, 
what it's actually doing is making a, a virtual view that's pointing to a file that's out in the Hadoop uh, system. The second set of code is creating a virtual view that's pointing to a table on a Teradata system. You could have views pointing again to Aster's file system or Aster's database. And then all you do, you create this data frame that points to those views you've set up. Very, very simple, very limited need or, or to be logging onto multiple systems or even worrying about where that data is once you do your initial mapping. You're able to just focus on the analysis. When you get to the data understanding, again, we talked about the challenge of even simple things like means and how you will probably have, you might have to go through variable by variable, by variable because of the memory constraints and iterate through. Again, if you have some simple things like our parallelized functions, you make a data frame, you can run it against all the data at one time, regardless of the number of columns, regardless of size. Vastly simplifies and scales data understanding. When you get to the time to analyze, uh, back to a common scenario, you want to run a cluster analysis. Your data maybe is spread out uh, across nodes by state. So you could run a cluster analysis for just California customers on one node or just Texas on another, but that's not necessarily going to give you the insights that you need, and it would be very difficult to combine those on the back end. You could write your own parallel k-means uh, algorithm, but that's very difficult. Or with Aster R, you can simply call our system parallel k-means algorithm with the data frame. It'll use all of the customers from all of the states to build you one model, which is 90% of the time exactly what people are looking for. The fourth problem, deployment. If you want to deploy R, there's several common ways. You have to get some type of, type of supercomputer with virtually unlimited memory. Nobody has the budget for that. You can do the classic extract all the data, score it offline, and write it back. It takes a lot of labor, a lot of system resources. It's not very efficient. It won't it, uh, could theoretically solve deployment, but it won't solve that industrialization that comes next. You can do a lot of companies do. Give your, your R code to IT. Have them recode it into some other language uh, to run on whatever system it has to do. That takes a lot of time. It also adds a lot of risk because you could have a coder that doesn't understand it. Another option that works great, if you have permission, is using things like PMML and in-database, uh, in-platform scoring. Oftentimes, you need IT to enable that for you. Again, with Aster R, once this is set up, once you have access and have mapped those other data sources, it's very easy to simply call up and direct that scoring routine to happen. It can get anything from thousands to many terabytes of data. Last, when it comes to industrialization, then, just using traditional R out of the box, you're going to be stuck working with samples. The processing is going to be slower with the single threads. Uh, you're bound uh, by not only memory constraints, but hard, complex parallel programming, and often then having to recode the models into another language to deploy. After R, you get a self-serve access to a variety of data through the query grid, very fast execution, and incredibly scalable uh, processing. You don't have to worry in many cases about the parallel programming and, uh, and the flexibility to still run any open source R that you might have. So to wrap up, if there's other information that you want, there's a hyperlink here that you can go to and learn all about, uh, all about Teradata Aster R. And with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to the moderator for the last polling question, then we'll do some Q&A. Hi, Bill, are you there? Yes. All right, folks, our third polling question, third and final, is on the screen for you now. Please do take a moment to respond to that. We do appreciate your involvement with it. Here it comes. All right. What would you like to learn more about? Select all that apply, please. How to easily access and integrate data from multiple sources using R? How to run R analytics in parallel? How to create models leveraging R, SQL, and SQL map reduce. Understand model deployment considerations for business analytics. Integrating R into production applications. Please, again, select all that apply. And folks, keep those questions coming in. Lots of great questions coming in. Click that group chat widget, type it and send it in, and Q&A will be here shortly. We'll now turn the program back to Bill and James. Okay, great. And uh, Yasmin, if you could just maybe push out those poll results real quick. Okay, excellent. So I think it uh, looks like pretty even interest there. Um, 
uh, all of information on all of those should be available uh, through that link. And to the extent that they're not, there will be contact information at that link uh, to get you in touch with someone who can answer your uh, questions. So with that, I will ask a couple of I will uh, bring up a couple of questions that were submitted. Uh, there was one here that says, are there any plans to extend R into the integrated data warehouse Teradata uh, platform officially, or is Teradata still working via partnership for that, uh, such as Revolution Analytics? That's a, a great question. Uh, uh, for those who are familiar with Revolution Analytics, that is currently the primary uh, um, method that we have for uh, leveraging R with our Teradata platform family as opposed to the uh, Aster uh, Discovery platform, and uh, Revolution is a is a uh, parallelized version of R as well, which is uh, you know out of the scope of the call today. But that is uh, the currently uh, that is still the main mechanism for Teradata. Let's see. Another question uh, was: Does Aster have its own client? So Aster, uh, there is a. a, a a way to work directly on Aster as you could on a lot of other platforms. But part of the key here is you can actually connect with, uh, with for example, the R console that you're familiar with and connect it to Aster and have it submit to Aster. So uh, there, there's not any inherent requirement to vastly change anything you're doing to leverage what we're uh, talking about, other than the need, obviously, to have Aster in place and, and you know, get uh, familiar with and trained on how to use these. Another one, and I'll, uh, I'll make a quick comment, and James, I, I'd be interested in your thoughts on this. Someone said, you know, they're, they're really lost and confused. Where do they even begin learning big data? Um, my view on that is that, uh, you know, big data is, is, encompasses a lot of different things. At base, though, it's data that's being used for analysis. I think that there are any, any of the traditional analysis methodologies and approaches are worth studying to learn how to analyze them. There's a lot of new things that have come of age with big data. Uh, I, I think, uh, you know, learning big data uh, or trying to use R to learn big data is probably a difficult task. I would see more having an understanding of what you're trying to do with big data and why, uh, and understanding the, the parameters of the business problem, and then using R as a tool to then go solve uh, that problem. James, do you have any thoughts on that one? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, obviously there's a, there's a raft of, of books on this topic, including, if I remember correctly, one by this guy called Bill Franks. Um, but, the, but I would say that I, I think you have to divide the problem up into pieces, uh, exactly as you say, that there's, a, there's the, um, the data side of it. Well, what are these new kinds of data types, and why are they more interesting or more challenging or more difficult? And it's like there's the, you know, uh, understanding what people mean by the Internet of Things and sensor data, understanding why weblog data is harder to analyze. So there's the sort of the data side of things. There's the third-party data that's available, the sort of data marketplaces, and why is that exploding? And then there's the, the sort of analytics piece of this, which is the how do I become a more data-driven organization? Well, that means using analytics to improve my decision making. So I think you need to, if you want to learn about big data, you've got to tackle the problem from multiple dimensions. You've got to look at, you know, say the marketplace, you've got to look at the different types of data, you've got to look at different types of analytics, and you've got to learn a little bit about all those things. And the one thing you should not do uh, is allow yourself to be driven by learning about the technology first. And so both, I would agree with you about R not being a place to start necessarily. I'd also say that things like Hadoop are not a place to start. They're saying, oh, I'm going to learn about big data by learning Hadoop. Is, is putting the cart before the horse. You learn about Hadoop because it's a way to help you handle big data, but you have to understand big data first. So I think uh, the way you learn about it is by sort of taking a step back from the technology and, and you know, recognizing what a broad topic we're talking about. Okay. And uh, let me see a, another question. It said, one of the challenges you mentioned in traditional deployment options was coding complexity. What does Aster R do to reduce that complexity? Does it provide wizards, or is it simply the reduction of complexity on the back end? That is a very good question. So it's more the sim simplifying of uh, the back end in terms of having the easy ability to point to the different data sources and having some of those uh, callable functions that have already been fully uh, parallelized. There's not a user interface GUI uh, wizard uh, uh, implementation on top of it at this point. Uh, it's back to if you're already doing uh, a lot of coding manually, this should make that manual coding uh, shorter and, and more efficient and, again, have access to, to not just more data but, but a, a better ability to uh, use that data at scale. 
Let's see. I saw another question. Let me find this real quick. Okay, another question. Is Aster open source? The answer is uh, no. It, it is licensable. There are, if you go to our website, there are some downloads where you can experiment and, and try out uh, uh, Aster. But the, uh, the core product and, and, and the Aster functionality is, is not an open source. It's allowing you to utilize the open source uh, R code uh, more effectively. Yeah, I want to add something there, Bill. I mean, I think you know, that's a crucial distinction there, but it's, it's also an illustration of why uh, integrating with R is, is such a, an important step for an analytic platform, right? Because it does allow you, as someone who wants to get into playing with analytics, to use open source tools to get started, to learn what you're doing, to try different things, and maybe you discover that there's some algorithm or collect some algorithms in R that really makes sense for an analytic problem. And then you can, you know, look to platforms like Aster to help you scale that when you when you need to actually sort of put it into production and get serious with it, right? It's a it's a nice balance of that being able to go experiment a little bit uh, without having to necessarily, you know, um, you know, make commitments with it and then sort of be able to then say, but know that you've got this option uh, that you can scale this stuff up and, and get serious about it uh, over time. I think that's a really powerful combination for analytics teams that are that are looking into, you know different ways to approach the problem. All right, and I think we might have time for uh, one, uh, one more that I saw, which was uh, how do you actually connect the systems when, I, when we talked about being able to connect the Teradata, uh, connect to Hadoop, et cetera, you know, how do you specify and get Aster connected to those other systems to enable you to do those data frames? And that's part of what the, the, our query grid functionality uh, makes, makes very uh, easy. Uh, an administrator would have to set it up initially, but for example, whatever's in the data dictionary in a Teradata uh, environment, and there's a couple other relational databases we support as well, you'd be able to easily access then through Query Grid. Similarly with Hadoop, currently if you have H Catalog configured, anything that is uh, configured within H Catalog can be automatically uh, made available uh, quickly and easily. So uh, again, I don't think we, we don't have time to get into a deep technical detail on that. But uh, that, I think that's really part of what uh, we offer as a whole suite of products is, is taking care of a lot of these uh, housekeeping details for the user so that the user does not have to uh, you know, worry about as many of those things themselves and can focus on analysis. That's really what it comes down to. Uh, there's no value in me moving data or in me defining connections other than to the extent I can then do analysis. So the more I can focus on the analysis and the less I have to focus on all of those little uh, uh, tactical exercises, uh, the better. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll wrap up with about two minutes to go. I'll see James, did you have any uh, closing thoughts before we wrap yeah, up? Yeah, I, I, well, one, one, one comment and one closing thought. So the comment, um, someone asked about the Rexa Analytics survey. Uh, if you're interested in, in Kyle's survey, you can just go to rexaanalytics.com and you can find uh, all the data. Uh, the sample size that he typically gets is um, hundreds of responders. Um, and uh, you know, within that, obviously, you know, relatively, um, relatively good numbers in terms of, of people using uh, specific products. And you know, the, the numbers are pretty consistent year on year. They match very well with uh, what sort of most of us in the business sort of think of it as. And so I think um, you know, it, it's a big enough sample to be to be serious without being thousands of people. So, uh, but it's great read. It's got a lot of good facts in the retro analytics survey. I, I guess the last. The comment I would make is I think um, there's tremendous excitement about analytics right now. Companies are becoming more and more analytic. And uh, I think this, this challenge of how do we scale it, how do we make sure that we don't just do a little bit of analytics, but we become really an analytic organization, become a data-driven organization, is really uh, a critical challenge for the analytics industry. We, we have to make sure that we begin as we mean to go on. And if you think forward a few years, your intent, if you're getting into analytics, is not that your company can have one analytic model running somewhere. Your intent should be that you're going to have dozens, hundreds of analytic models helping all sorts of people, all sorts of systems in your organization make better decisions. And so you have to think about how you're going to get to that. You have to begin with that end in mind. Otherwise, you're simply not going to uh, get the results that uh, your organization deserves. 
Yeah. And, and James, one last thing that uh, someone reminded me, there is, uh, I don't have time to get into it, there is an ability to have through our table operators on Teradata, you can do uh, some, some uh, deeper integration with R than was possible uh, in the past uh, directly uh, with Teradata. Uh, but again, that's something that uh, we could have people explore via the website and or their you know their Teradata contacts uh, separately. All right, and folks, with that, we are going to say a very big thank you to Teradata today for sponsoring our webcast, and a big thank you to James and Bill for presenting an outstanding presentation for all of us, and a big thank you to our audience who attended today and participated in the Q&A portion. And thank you so much for all the questions you sent in, folks, because having those questions really adds to our events. So we thank you so much. And as we close out, we would just like to let you know that open source R is the fastest growing analytic software in terms of user base and algorithms, with more than 5,500 packages supported by a vibrant user base. Surveys tell us that 60 to 70% of data miners use R, the tool of choice for data scientists. One of the major challenges of R today is data and processing scalability. Teradata after R solves the scalability issue by running open source R directly in the Teradata Aster database, leveraging the Aster MPP architecture. Teradata Aster R is designed for the R user, supporting existing R tools, language, and packages, and provides pre-built R functions that run in parallel across all data, hiding the complexity of parallel processing. Another powerful capability is the Astra R Parallel Constructor that allows users to build their own parallel analytics for more than 5,500 R analytic packages or any new analytic functions developed in the open source community. In today's webcast, we talked about how these advancements help break through current R limitations. Thank you again, Teradata. Folks, this will conclude today's webcast. Goodbye, everybody.